This is a quantum chemistry simulation, one of the most touted potential applications for quantum computers in the near term. And you don't have to go far to see why. The 2024 Nobel Prize in Chemistry was just awarded to two researchers who developed novel ways to predict protein structures with computer algorithms. The pharmaceutical industry has gone through a mini-revolution in the past 20 years, aided by computer-assisted chemistry research, helping big pharma and academic researchers alike optimize drugs like Ozempic. That said, these computer methods are not a silver bullet. Usually, if you want to directly simulate quantum mechanics inside the molecules, you can't simulate more than, say, 20 to 40 atoms, because quantum chemistry simulations are very computationally expensive, meaning that as you increase the size of the system that you want to simulate, the time that it takes to do that simulation increases exponentially. That said, sometimes it's beneficial to more directly calculate the physics of what's going on in a molecule. This is where quantum computing comes in. If you want to simulate a molecule accurately, you need to simulate quantum mechanics. Specifically, you need to accurately simulate the electrons involved in the chemical bonds that make up the molecules. Generally the way these simulations work is by taking a molecule's geometry as an input and then outputting the energy associated with that geometry. By iterating over different geometric parameters of our molecule, such as bond distance or angles, and applying the simulation at each step, we can calculate the energy associated with each configuration. Sometimes this is called a potential energy surface. Since, generally, low energy is considered favorable, the molecule will most likely be found in the lowest energy state that we find in this potential energy surface calculation. The real key part here though is the energy calculation. This is the hard part for our classical computers to do and takes the bulk of the time. Luckily, it turns out that we can outsource that part of the calculation to a quantum computer. One of the algorithms that does this is called the Variational Quantum Eigensolver, or VQE. This is a hybrid algorithm combining both classical and quantum computers. It's important to note that VQE is a bit dated and there are algorithms thought to be better. They're just more complicated and they have less support right now. Also, it's possible for the VQE to get stuck in a local minimum, meaning that it doesn't actually find the right energy for a given geometry. If you want to look more into the technical problems that come up with VQE, I'll leave some resources in the description. However, for the purposes of this video, the VQE is a great case study to look into for quantum chemistry simulations. First though, we have to pick a molecule that we want to simulate. While it would be cool to simulate some complicated protein, unfortunately quantum computers just aren't there yet. Instead, we'll simulate another biologically relevant molecule, ammonia. The VQE works in four major steps. First, we're going to input a molecular geometry. This means that we need to put in the coordinates in Cartesian space of each atom in our molecule. Second, we'll use a quantum computer to measure the energy expectation value for the molecule that we inputted. This tells us about how stable our molecule is. The lower the energy, the more stable it is. Third, we'll use a classical computer to adjust the trial wave function based on the energy outputted by the quantum computer. This trial wave function is a mathematical function that we've described ourselves that has some parameters that we can adjust or change. The classical computer will adjust or change these and then see the impact that that makes on the actual energy value. Fourth, we'll repeat steps one through three until the energy converges to a single value. Okay. Since step 2 is the part that we actually need to do on a quantum computer, let's zoom into that now to see how we actually do this. There are three total steps within step 2. First, we have to break down the molecule's geometry into a string of poly matrices. When we input a molecular geometry, what we actually get is something known as the Hamiltonian. The Hamiltonian for a molecule is a mathematical object, specifically a matrix, which describes the kinetic and potential energy of the system. For the molecule, the Hamiltonian contains all of the information about where the atoms are placed, how the electrons repel each other, how they're attracted to the nuclei, and so on. Poly matrices are a set of a few simple matrices with nice properties. In the case of VQE, poly matrices tell us what axis, x, y, or z, to measure each qubit along. Second, we have to generate an ansatz, or guess at what the resulting wave function should look like. The wave function is the mathematical function that describes where our electrons in our molecule are most likely to be. To get a final correct wave function, we need to supply the VQE with a guess wave function that has some parameters that we can tune. For example, if our function looks like this, 
where x is the position, the parameters that we can tune here are the constants a, b, k, and z. Third, we then, on the quantum computer, measure the energy of the Ansatz wave function using the decomposed Hamiltonian. We do this in two steps. First, we prepare our qubits in the state of our initial guess, the Ansatz. We then use the string of poly operators that we got from the initial step to direct our measurements. Specifically, the type of poly matrix tells us which axis to measure the state of our qubit along. Doing this for the full poly string gives us the energy of our molecule. To see how this works, let's implement this on a quantum simulator. We'll do this using CUDA Q, a quantum programming library developed by NVIDIA, the sponsor of this video. I'd like to thank NVIDIA for their support with this video, including some technical help and hardware support. Alright, so let's set up the notebook to get this done in Google Colab. First, let's just check to make sure that our Colab notebook is actually connected to a GPU. If it is, we should see a check mark and then the GPU name in the top right corner. In my case, this is the NVIDIA T4 GPU. Next, we can run the NVIDIA SMI command, which should tell us that there is a GPU that we're connected to with some drivers and a version of CUDA. To start off with CUDA Q, we'll need to install the necessary scientific Python libraries. Once they're installed, we can install CUDA Q. Now, with those libraries installed, you'll want to import CUDA Q, PyPlot, SciPy.optimize, and NumPy. We can set the CUDA Q target to NVIDIA so that it knows that we're using an NVIDIA GPU to run the simulation. Next, we can define the molecular geometry by writing down all of the internal coordinates of the ammonia molecule. If we call the origin of our axes, meaning 0, 0, 0, the nitrogen atom, then we can write down the positions of the three hydrogen atoms relative to that. Next, we'll create a Hamiltonian using the CUDA Q chemistry module. Remember, the Hamiltonian is the sequence of quantum operations that we pass into our quantum computer, and it mathematically describes the energy of our ammonia molecule. By using this Hamiltonian in conjunction with the ansatz on a quantum computer, we should be able to extract the energy from our molecule. Next, we set the number of electrons that we'll use as well as the number of qubits that we'll use to model those electrons. This basically sets how accurate our ansatz is. Now, we can set up our kernel for running the code. This lets us run the specific code within this function on the quantum hardware while running the rest of the code on classical hardware. In this case, we're just going to use a simulator, but if we call the function inside this block, it'll run on whatever quantum hardware we have specified. With CUDA Q, we can run this simulation on the Colab GPU that we connected to before, which should speed things up a lot compared to a normal CPU simulation. If you do have access to quantum hardware, you can just change the CUDA Q target from the simulator to that specific target hardware. Unfortunately, YouTube doesn't pay me well enough to get access to a real quantum computer for a simulation this big. Inside this kernel, we need to define a function. This is the quantum part of the VQE that actually prepares our quantum state for use in the energy calculation. We do this using the CUDA Q UCCSD function, which is a specific ansatz or guess for what the initial functions of our electrons should look like. Basically, the UCCSD ansatz provides us a platform or a base for us to find the energy from. We can also find the number of parameters involved in our VQE. We need this to initialize our circuit on the quantum computer with the right number of qubits. This ensures that we're changing the right number of parameters in our optimization. Now, we can do one of two things. We can immediately run this quickly by picking an optimizer and then calling the CUDA Q VQE function and printing the resulting energy. Or we can do a bit more work and watch the simulation progress. That's what we're going to do. To watch the simulation progress, we need to write our own minimizer. To do this, we need three functions. First, a cost function. This basically returns the energy that we measure in our quantum computer from the kernel function that we defined above. The goal of our VQE will be to minimize this cost function, meaning make it as low as possible. Usually this is a negative number, so the more negative the better, because this indicates a lower energy confirmation which is more stable. Next, we'll define a plotting function. This function just updates a plot with the last result from our simulation. Finally, we need a callback function. This function calls our plotting function and prints out the energy at each step. We can then use the scipy minimize function to minimize the cost function while plotting the progress using the plotting and callback functions. We can see that the energy fluctuates a lot at first. This is expected for most types of chemistry simulations as the simulator plays around with various parameters which may or may not strongly impact the energy. 
We can see though that if we let this run long enough, the solution eventually converges to a single number plus or minus some very small amount. Once this happens, we say that our simulation has converged to the proper energy. Now, the billion dollar question. Can we run this on an actual quantum computer? The short answer is kinda. Some research groups have already successfully run the VQE on an actual quantum computer for very small molecules. I believe that the current largest example was 12 hydrogen atoms in a chain simulated by Google. However, this takes a lot of time on quantum computers due to noise and decoherence. As a result, running a simulation like the one I ran today is quite difficult and would likely require me to pay a company like Google or IBM a lot of money. Thus, while theoretically possible to run such a simulation, it's not necessarily easy for me to do. If you guys are interested in me doing a simulation on a real quantum computer, let me know in the comments below and I'll try and get that type of access in the future. If you enjoyed this video and want to learn more about quantum hardware, check out this video that I made on quantum hybrid classical supercomputers. Otherwise, I've been Lucas, this has been Lucas's Lab, and thanks for watching.